God, God, God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. Not a very wholesome way to begin a discussion about the main questions, such as why are we here, who are we, what are we here for, what is the just city, how would it look like, what is the meaning of life. Those who take this view, which we will call the secularist position in theology, are of course strongly influenced by contemporary philosophy, especially in that form which is called scientific empiricism or logical positivism, which maintains that the idea of God is not a fallacy, but is a meaningless idea. That, in other words, the proposition that there exists God and that God is the origin and creator and governor of everything that is happening, they maintain that those sentences are utterly devoid of meaning, as much so as if I were to say everything is up. So I, I was not hearing in that list of attributes a God who could care if anyone masturbated. It depends on what else it's stopping you from doing. It's yeah, important but to live. But seriously. It's, it's important to do something other than masturbate. I'm not hearing a, a, a God, a personal God, who can possibly hear anyone's prayers, much less answer them. The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of this. A personal God who can possibly hear anyone's prayers, much less answer them. The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding, lost somewhere between immensity and eternity is our tiny planetary home, the Earth. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. All the laws appear to operate without that assumption. Because they will say no logical proposition can be made about all processes whatsoever. Because all propositions are labels on boxes. Uh, it's very, very, very rare indeed to meet a physicist of any standing, from Einstein onwards, who is not at the most a Spinozist. In other words, someone who might say there could be a pantheism somewhere, there could be a force. Uh, but there is no, no way you can take a step from the laws of physics, the observable creation of the cosmos, uh, that leads you to the belief that there is an intervening personal God who does answer prayers, who does watch over you, who does notice what you're up to, who does mind what you do, who you sleep with and in what position, uh, what you eat, what you eat and on what days of the week, uh, what propitiations and sacrifices you will make, what commandments you will observe. There is no possible way, no one's even tried it, of getting from the laws of physics or biology to any such idea. So from de uh, the person who says, I'm a deist, I don't think all of this can be an accident, there must be some cosmic force, I say, I can't disprove it, though I think the cosmos functions without it, but you have all your work, sir, or ma'am, still ahead of you, before you can say that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, let alone that he was the son of God, let alone that his mother was a virgin, let alone that he was resurrected. None of these things, by the way, would prove he was the son of God, if they did happen nor would they prove that his doctrines were not erroneous. A resurrected person who was the son of a virgin could still be talking nonsense. There's no logic that says he must be right. If I'm having an argument with you, sir, and you say, you lose, boy chick, I say, how come? Because my mother never went to bed with, a, uh, with another man. Your logic is faulty. I think my, uh, my case could remain just as strong as ever it was. Uh, in default of that, I must say, rather bizarre uh, intervention. Uh, I don't believe there is a supernatural dimension, um, and I don't believe there have ever been any miracles, so I don't believe that prayers are answered, I don't believe any of this. None of this comes up so far in this argument. I'm not arguing with a religious person yet at all. I'm arguing with someone who claims to know more than I do about physics and biology. It's possible that he does. Many, many people do. But bear in mind that we cannot say that we know that there was not a prime mover. It it, it's not within our compass pitifully ignorant as we are, only scrabbling on the lower slopes of the study of physics, as all of us are, even the best. And also, they would say, the notion that there is a God is meaningless because uh, it doesn't help you to make any prediction. We may not say that we know there was no prime mover. We may not say that. 
um, we can say that all the laws appear to operate without that assumption. Uh, it's very, very, very rare indeed to meet a physicist of any standing, from Einstein onwards, who is not at the most a Spinozist. In other words, someone who might say there could be a pantheism somewhere, there could be a force. Atheist, uh, agnostic, they go together. Okay. Because you don't but, want to what, pretend what, you What's know. animating your kind of moral passion then? I mean, is it just the sense that, you, you know, this is a wrong, well, that we could do better than this? I mean, where, where is it coming from? Good question. From? So you, you implicitly state a moral relationship to religion, which is interesting. Well, I, I see spirituality and religion as, as very, very different. I, very good. Okay. I, we're referring to an atheist. Though. When I say atheist, doesn't mean I'm unnecessarily spiritual okay. in the sense of well, how, seeing connection. Okay, well, spirituality is connection. For the first time, we have the power to decide the fate of our planet and ourselves. This is a time of great danger, but our species is young and curious and brave. It shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. Because this box would have no outside, and therefore it wouldn't be a box. It's how you understand your relationship to each other, to things, to your body, to your health, to the world, to the universe. So all propositions, all words, must refer to classes of some kind, and you can't have the class of all classes. And it's that systemic relationship, and the more you learn about that, the more it defines who you are and your role. And you can look at it mechanistically, or you can look at it, actually, no, you have to look at it mechanistically. <laughs> I think, and that sounds cold, but what I mean by that is it's the, the progress of understanding yourself has to be a technical process on some level. And you can't have the box containing all boxes. There are gaps between every two ones where you find a field of possibilities, a field of pure potentiality. There has to be some defining features that can be, that can be uh, deduced to a degree and, and associated without necessarily there being a, a, a meta level that's in, completely undescribable, you know what I mean? Science doesn't call it God, but what is God if not the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, and all that will be? Or they can ask it in this way. What scientific proof or evidence of any sort can you muster to support your assertion that there is, for lack of a better term, God or some sort of intelligence at the heart of the universe. What evidence, supposing somebody could bring it forward, would completely satisfy you as disproving the existence of God? But if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. So I just want you to be sensitive to this, because if Michael or I say something derogatory about Islam or Christianity, which seems possible, <laughs> uh, the, the response from the other side shouldn't mention quantum mechanics. Science also tells us that this is a field of non-locality, where everything is correlated with everything else. My uh, adversaries are going to point out, no, no, everything, God is explained by neurology. Well, I hope today, Michael, that you will convert from a skeptic to a neuroskeptic. What percentage of those religious people do you think have in mind a god of the sort you just described? I don't know, Sam. It's a good question because when I go talk to people, when I, when I talk to people online and use exactly this terminology, millions of people listen. Because your science is really frozen in the dungeons of conservatism, and in the dungeons of orthodoxy. And, and, it, and it shouldn't reference a, a, a notion of God that is so denuded of doctrine as to more or less be synonymous with pure mystery or pure information or pure energy or pure anything. So it's not so yeah. obvious well, which, what percentage of no, people see it this way. It's, it may can, be that they have the intuitions, but they haven't been articulated well. We can talk about anything we want. I'm happy to talk about consciousness. But please notice that when, when we migrate away from the God that is really shaping human events, uh, or the God talk that is really shaping human events in our world at this moment. You could do the same thing with the idea of, a, of ghosts, right? So, so people traditionally have believed in ghosts. It's, a, it's an archetype, you might say, the ghost. Survival of death is certainly an archetype. So they, and, and we know what most people most of the time mean when they say they believe in ghosts. And I say, I don't believe in ghosts. And you say, no, no, you, you do believe in ghosts. Ghosts are your relationship to the unseen. 
that's a ghost. So you, you have a, a, a new definition of ghost that you're putting in, in the place provided, which I have to say, well, of course I have a relationship to the unseen, so I, yeah, I guess I do believe in ghosts. You know, you, you win that argument. But that simply isn't what most people mean by a ghost. So obviously there's absolutely no way of demonstrating this. As human beings, we're uncomfortable with saying, I don't know. This is something I'm trying to teach people to become more comfortable with, is to say, I don't know that these myths have a certain use, even though we can't verify them. What they do is to give us a sense of the world making sense. So then, uh, realize that people who adopt various theories of the world are actually mythologizing. I've heard something like that before. When asked what is the Buddha, a Chinese master replied, it's windy again this morning. Another Buddhist master, on his deathbed, wrote the poem, From the bathtub to the bathtub I have uttered stuff and nonsense. The bathtub in which the baby is washed at birth, and the bathtub in which the corpse is washed before burial. All the time between, he said, I was going yakety yak. Now, what about those poems? Do they mean what they say? Well, not quite. Uh, there's something different here, because they are based on a life devoted to the discipline of a very particular kind of meditation culminating in a completely shattering experience, which is very difficult to talk about. Then these instruments of perception are no good. Even what is light and darkness is a debate between you and another creature which sees darkness as light, isn't it? If you sit with an owl, uh, an owl and start an argument as to which is light and which is darkness, it's an endless argument, but who do you think is right? Hello? Uh, if you're saying both, you're either in the diplomatic core <laughs> or or you have a successful marriage, <laughs> which is the truth. What I see is the truth or what the owl sees is the truth. That's not the point, it is just that nature has opened up our sense perception as it is necessary for our survival. Accordingly, it has opened up sense perceptions for different creatures as it is necessary for their survival. But if survival is all you're seeking, this is good enough, the five senses. But once you have come as a human being, somehow survival is not good enough. If your stomach is empty, there's only one issue about food. But once the stomach becomes full, you have a hundred issues going on. So the nature of the human being is such, no matter what you do, you want to be something more than what you are right now. And if that something more ha happens, something more, something more, it's an endless pursuit. So somewhere a human being is seeking a limitless expansion. But generally speaking, it is the encounter with eternity, with the eternal, not in necessarily in the sense of that which goes on and on and on through time, but… But trying to do it with physical means. The eternal is the timeless, that which transcends time is beyond measurement in terms of hours and days. The very nature of physicality is a defined boundary. If there is no defined boundary, there is no possibility of physical happening in the universe. But now, a human being is longing for the boundless, that too in installments, and through physical means, through the boundary, you're trying to become boundless. The desire is fantastic, the method is hopeless, because the moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect's work is just to protect that identity. If you… whatever the identities of nation or family or gender or race, religion, whatever, the moment you identify yourself with something, your intellect will only function around that to protect that. So, it is a certain type of prejudice the moment you're identified. And when a person who is in that state of consciousness or has been through it looks at uh, the ordinary everyday world, it's true, he sees the ordinary everyday world as we see it, but with a very, very extraordinary difference. So the only thing I did with my life is, I never identified myself with anything and life just exploded within me in ways that thought seems so puny that I do not indulge in thought most of the time. And if we would have to put that difference into some sort of Western Christian influence language, he would perhaps say, don't you realize that sitting around here in this room You know, what you're saying, for all of us here, in some way, shape or form, we all pride ourselves on thinking human beings. This is… this Think, is a tough thing to swallow. Thinking is just recycling of the data that you already gathered <laughs> So. What is… what is the leap of faith that you go from this 
from this perspective of thinking and thoughts to we don't belong to anyone, you know, we, we, we are not identified with, so, with any instrument, with, with, with any sort of localness. And, see, and I know both of you have spoken the, about that. The thing is, this is not something that people will not get. They will get this. This is not some great teaching I'm telling you. With our ordinary everyday faces and clothes and personalities. If you get it right now in your life, your life will transform in ways that you can't imagine possible. We are sitting smack in the middle of the beatific vision. Otherwise, someday you will get it from the maggots. And that this sitting here in this room <laughs> is infinity and eternity precisely. You will understand you don't belong to anything. <laughs> so, you are the entire culture of what is… what you're calling as Bharat is about Vairag. The word vairag means, rag means color, vairag means beyond color. But if you say colorless in English language, it is a very negative connotation of being colorless. Let's put it as transparent. Because it's transparent, it, it can take on the color of anything right now. It is it. And this is the beatific vision. Right now, if my background is red, I am red. If it's yellow, I am yellow. This is God. And it feels that way too, it really does, or something like it. But in this kind of religion, they still have temples, they have Buddhas and they chant sutras and offer incense and ring gongs and all that kind of thing. But they're always saying that the highest religion, to get really to get there, you have to kill the Buddha. Hi, I'm Dan Harris and this is a Nightline Face Off. Our question is, does God have a future? Dr. Chuck, well, do you have something to add to that? Just to elaborate on what he said. Supposing a clergyman got up one day in the pulpit and said, <clears throat> every time you say Jesus Christ, you have to wash your mouth out. All of us have had the is there a God debate, I'm sure, and perhaps with the assistance of non-medical marijuana. <laughs> or if you meet God the Father, kill him. If you meet God the Son, kill him. Given the advances of science, have we outgrown the idea of God? If you meet God the Holy Spirit, kill him. If you meet the Pope, kill him. If you meet uh, St. Augustine, kill him. If you meet your father and mother, kill them. Some in this debate tonight will argue just that, that science shows us that in fact God is dead. Kill them all right away. All right, what I've been saying is simply translating into Christian terms a Buddhist teacher uh, talking about the year 800 AD. <clears throat> That's what he said. Only he put the Buddhist names in where I put the Christian ones in. But I don't think this is what is happening in the movement of the new theology. What he experiences being, right? Another word for awareness or existence. It's not a thought. Thought is what creates the subject-object split. Um, being is all there is, and being is not a thought. Okay. So as even now, if I asked you, are you aware? That's being. Now, everything else is just a modulation of that. It's a feeling or a thought or a sensation or a perception. We call that the mind. We call that the body. We call that the universe. But all there is is being and its modulations. Because what you experience is sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. And then you say, oh, that's a tree. That's a body. That's a universe. That's a rock. There are just different combinations of being and its modulations. Did so, you all understand that? Thoda some. It's a very, and, and I think this is part of the, the complexity I think we all struggle with. Because about. you try to explain it in words. But again, as you're listening, turn to who is listening. And I think, Dr. Chopra, the interesting question is, and, and Sadhguru, this is for you as well. Essentially, what we are doing in this whole process of asking all of us to change the prism is you're essentially asking us to experience it in some way. Yeah, he said the mistake of the intellect. It's the, the mistake, mistake of, of the intellect yes. that uh, uh, there is separation between observer and observed. And, because and the, the observer and observed as mind and body are a single holistic activity of the total universe. I think that what's happening there is that they are just getting rid of God. For a God, because science can account for everything. This is not this other thing I'm talking about, which could be called the religion of no religion. The other side of the debate will argue that in fact science has brought us closer to God. You see, if you, you could take this right into Christianity. But um, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science... So what can't it account for? Well, 
I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. And so when you ask me about consciousness, my answer is, I don't know. You know, it seems obvious at one level, and it's yet very difficult to grasp on the other. But for other people, they're so uncomfortable with I don't know that they posit an explanation that they cannot justify, something that's untestable and unfalsifiable, and that is that there's a ghost in the machine. Could you just talk to us about what For some are? of us who br were brought up, educated in a scientific worldview or in a worldview that emphasizes recycled information, as he said, or uh, all of that, it's very difficult to intellectually get to being because um, we identify, as he said, perceptual experience with our intellect, with our mind, with our ego identity. So it always seems a struggle till one day you stop struggling and you're there. And as he said, he never identified with anything. Once you identify with a thought or with a perception or with a, what you think is annoying or a sensation or an emotion, then you're in time. Thought is in time, but being is not in time. I'm uh, completely spiritually uneducated. I don't know from where I have quoted, I have not quoted generally, except a modern scientist is trying to deduce, mathematically deduce the reality. Everything has to fit in to his math and he will deduct everything and say the entire universe is one, but it's not in his experience. A religious person will say, God is everywhere, so everything is one, but it's not yet in his experience, he believes. One is deducting… With the, making deductions, another is believing. A yogi is a hard nut who doesn't believe anything who doesn't want to deduce anything. Unless it becomes real within him, it's not real for him. So, because of this approach, I… I never found the need to read anything spiritual. If I read something, it may be a news magazine and the only thing, the only and only thing I know is, I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate and that's all.